Hi everyone, welcome to this month's Patron's Choice video with the topic of early signs of Asperger's. So if you're new to this blog, my name is Paul and I am currently 33. I discovered I'm on the spectrum about three years ago now. You can check out my diagnosis story video if you're interested to hear more about that. So when I walked into the psychologist's office, apparently my autism was obvious within the first 30 seconds or so. So how was it obvious? These days it's common to diagnose autism as early as preschool or even younger. So surely looking back over my life at that age, there must have been some signs for me too. So this video is not a list of early warning signs or anything like that and it's definitely not intended to be used for diagnosis. Instead, it's actually something a lot more valuable. It's the story of one person and how all of these seemingly unrelated little peculiarities that you'd think every child has, when you put it all together, makes a completely different picture. So I've broken it up into four sections. So we've got sensory sensitivities, uh, uncommon interests, uh, my learning styles, and then finally, how all of these led to an array of social challenges. And for each of these, I'll be telling a couple of short stories to get a sense of what I was like at the time. So this is by no means an exhaustive list of all of the early signs of Asperger's for me, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of what I was like in those early years. So to start off with, sensory issues were probably the easiest thing that others could see from the outside. So I was clearly very sensitive to smell and noise and, and touch. Um, and certain textures. So this is me at the beach as a baby trying my very best to avoid touching the sand. So I used to be kind of proud of this superpower of being able to hear things that other people couldn't hear, specifically higher frequencies. But actually in real life, it's not so much that I could hear it, it's more that above a certain frequency, I stopped hearing the sound and I started just feeling pain. So a good example of this is squeaky brakes in a car, for example. There are some frequencies in the audible range that we can hear, but then it comes along with some higher that actually just cause pain. I remember one time at a birthday party, I must have been maybe seven years old, and I drank half a can of fizzy drink. I was so proud of myself because previously, even the tiniest sip was massively overstimulating for my lips. So being able to sit there and slowly sip it and, and get all the bubbles out and get through half a can was like the highlight of my whole day. I also had some strange food sensitivities. For example, I couldn't stand the taste of rice, like plain rice by itself. But at the same time, I would eat lemons when I was really young. Apparently one of my first words was more, as in, please give me another slice of lemon to eat. So sure, that's a little strange, I guess, but don't all kids have funny eating habits? How is this any different? So in terms of my interests as a kid, they probably seem quite stereotypical on the outside. I mean, I was really into dinosaurs and outer space and things like that. Pretty common, right? Um, the only thing is I took these to a bit of an extreme. I mean, I was writing out tables and listing the distance from each planet from the sun and how long it took them to orbit and um, how long they would take to spin on their own axis and things like this. I remember a time when I was in, prob I probably would have been about seven or eight, and I was chatting to a friend at school, and in those days we were taught nine planets, you know, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, right? Pluto being the furthest one out. And so I was having a discussion with this kid at school, and I was trying to tell him that Pluto has an elliptical orbit, which means at the moment it's closer to the sun than Neptune is. And he wasn't having a bar of it. He said, no, 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 Neptune is closer to the sun and then Pluto's further away. So anyway, we, we ended up making a bet, for lack of a better word, and, say, and I said, look, I can prove this. I've got a book at home. I'll bring it in. I'll show you. So I did, and I brought it in, and I showed him, and he just didn't listen and didn't care and he didn't follow through with the um, what we bet on. I think we I think he was going to give me a book or something something small like that. So um, that feels like a really stereotypical scenario for me and I really hate being right. I feel like if I know something is true, it's because it's my special interest and I've researched it to death and when other people don't, listen or don't care, it, it can be really difficult. Um, 
Another example of getting slightly obsessed with something is one day I learned about different paper sizes like A4, A5, B4, etc. So I went home and I made all of them, like gluing pieces of paper together and putting them all together and cutting them out and folding them. And, um, so that's the kind of stuff I was interested in, really, really structured stuff. Um, another interesting thing is my playing style. So in hindsight, I was always more interested in the physical properties of toys than what they were supposed to represent. I once had a baby's toy um, that, I, that I played with until you know, I was quite old and it was a weighted ball that I would just spin it around and, and watch how the angular momentum worked, right? So this, this ball was supposed to be for like a, a two month year old baby and, and here I was at the age of like 10 still playing with it because it was cool and it had a funny weight to it. Um, and in a similar way, when I was playing with things like matchbox cars, I would just smash them into each other and watch them bounce off and see which one could flip the other one. So that's not really using them as cars. I wasn't holding it in my hand, pretending this was a car going down the road, vroom, vroom, oh, this is a fire truck, it's gonna go put out a fire. I was like, oh, this is a fire truck, it's gonna um, slam into a school bus and see which one flips over or not. So it was very creative, but it, it was almost like I was creating an imaginary world that was a lot more interesting than the real world. So when I was five years old, I changed schools halfway through the year in my first year of school. So interestingly, I just discovered this now, but on my report card from that first school, it said that I had a learning disability. So on the same report card, it said, Paul is a high achiever in all areas of the prep curriculum. And then later it says, Paul has a learning problem, which is quite noticeable in the classroom. With background noise, he is often oblivious to any statement made to him. Now, in hindsight, that explains a lot because so often my experience of primary school was asking the question, how do people know what's going on? How do you know what homework we have to do? How do you know where to line up? How do you know what we're supposed to be doing right now? Because I would get distracted by something and I literally wouldn't hear what the teacher was trying to say. Apart from this though, my experience of school was that it was mind-numbingly boring. I remember coming home from school one day, I was probably six or seven, and saying, hey mum, did you realise that some people actually find school difficult? Like, this was blowing my mind. I just assumed that everyone else was having a similar experience to me. It's just that I was having such a different experience to all the others in my classroom that it put me on the outer when I was trying to understand them. So to combat this boredom, I had a habit of trying to find the most creative answer to a question that I could think of that was still a correct answer. So if the teacher was saying, can you please name all these animals? I would say something like, okay, well, so this one's Lucy and this one's Harry and this one's, you know, instead of like dog, cow, sheep, whatever. So this kind of creativity, for lack of a better word, was getting me in trouble sometimes at school. I remember one day in grade three and we were learning how to cut shapes in half, right? So what we were supposed to do is cut them in half, like this. Wow, incredibly boring. So what I decided to do instead is look for another answer. How else could I cut this shape in half um, other than just drawing a line through, through the middle? So I thought, well, I could do this, right? I could cut it like this, so long as this length is the same as this length. I thought that was a perfectly valid answer. But apparently, no, you know, what I should have done, clearly, was gone from corner to corner like this. So as you can see, at school, I was typically a frustrated, bored child. So another story that I remember is from kindergarten, and we were learning about shapes. So you can imagine we're all sitting on the floor and she holds up, what's this? Triangle, what's this? Square. Um, and then she holds up one and it's like half a circle. And I thought, oh, what's this? I know the name for this. What is it? Like hemi, demi, semi, semicircle. That's it, semicircle. Um, and I was really excited, but unfortunately, due to all that thinking time, I was a little bit slow, and she assumed that no one knew the answer to this. Um, so I was completely fine with that, because she was about to tell us the answer, and she said, it's a half circle. And I thought, what? Are you serious? And so I can remember being three years old and getting really frustrated. The name for half a circle is a semicircle. Get it right. Okay, so finally, all these differences in sensory sensitivities and my learning style and what I found interesting, they all led to challenges trying to relate to the other kids my age. 
I remember my first year in kindergarten being three years old and actually thinking, how do I play with these other kids? What do I need to do? How do I figure out how to do this? And I was actually trying to solve this problem at an intellectual level. So they were playing this game and it was called King of the Castle. And how it would work is they would, they would climb up the play equipment and anyone who tried to climb up, they would basically stop them climbing up and say, I'm the king of the castle and you're the dirty, dirty rascal. And I didn't know really how to engage with this game because I would try and climb up and they'd push me down and, you know, that, was, that seemed to be how the game worked. So I thought, okay, well, clearly it's just the first one up there gets to be that role in the game. So one day I was on the ball and as soon as we got let out, I ran out and climbed up and I was the first one up there. And then um, another little girl tried to climb up and I pushed her down and said, I'm the king of the castle and you're the dirty rascal. And then she fell down and started crying and I got in trouble and I thought, wow, this is hard. <laughs> Why is trying to play with the other kids so hard? What am I supposed to do? What am I missing here? This is just not working. Anyway, so that was my experience at three years old. Um, I remember my very first play date when I was about five uh, in primary school. And my mother had arranged to have a different person pick me up from school and I, I would go home with another boy in my class and we would, we would spend an hour or so after school. And she'd pick me up at 5 p.m. And I thought, 5 p.m.? School finishes at 3.30 and we're going to go till 5 p.m. What on earth are we going to do for an hour and a half, just the two of us? How, how is that going to work? I've got no idea how that was going to work. And I had quite a bit of anxiety around that. But anyway, it just happened and it actually worked really well. It turns out my social skills when it's one-on-one -on -one, are actually pretty good. It's the group stuff that, that is always throwing me. So we had a great time and five o'clock came before we knew it and I went home and I was really excited and really happy because it just worked and I have no idea how it worked but it just worked. Another problem that was obvious in primary school is that often we needed to line up in pairs like before we go into class or after recess or things like that and because I never had a partner to line up with I was always at the back of the line even if I was the very first one there before anyone else when the bell rang after recess very, you know, one by one, others would come and they would have a buddy and I wouldn't have a buddy and I would end up at the back and I just didn't know how to find a buddy. How was, who was going to teach me how to find a buddy? And this was really significant and really memorable. So much so that I remember in grade three, I had a different teacher, a teacher that I, I really, um, he just did things a bit, di a bit differently and I really liked him. And he introduced us to the system of just filing in. So if there's a gap, you fill the gap. You don't wait to find a buddy, you just fill the gap. If there's one person in front of you and you're, you come and you're the last one on the line, you stand next to the last person in the line and it all just works. And this was amazing because what it meant was that I wasn't the last person in the line. For the first time in my entire life, I wasn't the last person in the line. So that was, a, that was a huge day for me when that happened. Another frustration I never quite worked out trying to play with the other kids in primary school is that they would make up the rules as we went along. And kind of in hindsight, it kind of makes sense. You're gonna play a game, it's a creative game, you're gonna make up the rules as a group as you go along. But the unfair thing was that they would make the rules and I would never be able to make any rules. And why do your rules get to stick and my rules get ignored? And I never quite figured out what, what is the process there? I thought these were the rules and now you're changing the rules and that's not fair. When I change the, I'm not allowed to change the rules, why are you allowed to change the rules? But in a group, for some reason, some people are allowed to change the rules and other people aren't. And I, I never really got that social dynamic of how that was supposed to work. Okay, so maybe we'll leave it there for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed these pictures. These have been just a handful of little anecdotes from my childhood that will hopefully give you a little bit of a sense of what I was like back then and some of the things that I was um, struggling with and some of the early signs that I was on the autism spectrum. So 
Um, thank you to the Patreon community for um, voting for this video. If you would like to have your say in next month's Patrons Choice video, you can join our Patreon family, become a supporter of this channel um, for less than a dollar a week. So that's a fun little community. We've got our own private Facebook group to keep in touch. We all met online the other day, which was really fun, meeting people from all over the world. So if you want to become a part of that, um, please check out the Patreon uh, link here. Um, otherwise, I will see you next week for another video from Asperger's from the inside. Thanks. Bye.